everybody out today. We appreciate you being out in the house of the Lord, and it's so good to see everybody out this morning. Welcome to Freedom Baptist Church. Wow, beautiful day out, and uh, we're just happy to be in the Lord's house and appreciate everybody. We've got a visitor with us this morning, Richard, and Richard, it's so good to have you, my brother. <laughs> said he's been driving by. He's from Missouri. As he said it like Rob said it, Missouri. And uh, so Rob was here and let, went back home. But anyhow, Richard, so good to have you, buddy. We appreciate you being here. And I asked him, I told him, I said, we're just old-time Christianity. So that's what I'm looking for. Amen. If that's what you're looking for, you found it. Amen. Just just put, shut all the other boxes off and say, I'm going to stay. But uh, we, we are glad to have you, Richard. Hope you enjoy yourself today. Make Richard feel right at home. But again, thank you for being here this morning. And and those that are online, I haven't gotten online yet. I've been taking care of other things and haven't gotten online, but I hope that uh, those that are online are with us this morning and go ahead and share the program and like it out, and I'll get on in just a minute. I want to say, number one, that the major did a great job, man, in, in West Virginia. I talked to him again this morning and, and just so excited and so exciting with what God is doing there in their lives, uh, up there in the, in the church camp. And uh, we're, just, we're just so happy for them. They had a great trip. Friday night service went great. And uh, man, they just enjoyed that. It was outside. If you didn't see the backdrop, they had the fireplace going on the backside. Man, it's cold up there. And then last night they had the young boy, Braden Williamson, uh, that sang and then, uh, then uh, Major preached after that. And they had a great time. And he got to see a lot of old folks. He took the camera, put me on, on messenger, you know, video phone yesterday and was going around saying, do you remember this one? Do you remember that one? Do you remember this one? Do you remember that one? And uh, the ones he asked me about, I got a thousand percent right. Oh, okay. But, uh, you, I, 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 you know, I, I probably couldn't have gotten them all, but uh, thank goodness he picked the right ones. But anyhow, they had a great trip, and thank you for being so loving and kind and, and supportive of that. Man, we had a great crowd on Friday night, on, on the program Friday night. And uh, that, was, that was just real nice, and we appreciate, appreciate all your love and all your support, and that means a lot to us and a lot to the major. I, I have to say this. I'll say this while he's not here, and I told him this on the phone this morning. I thought he handled himself like a seasoned veteran. I don't know if you – he did several. He did an interview with Davy Joe. Davy Joe's the guy that sings our closing song, moving out, moving up, moving on. Then they sang live both nights, Davy Joe and the Marriott Ambassadors, to close that out. 
And man, it was a blessing to hear them live. And, and, uh, but he interviewed Davy Joe, and Davy Joe got telling some old tales on me. Thankfully, told some that weren't too bad. And then he, you know, he showed, went down and did a little live presentation from the rock altar. And that's a place that I accepted a call to preach on June the 6th, 1977. And uh, as he said, he wasn't even born. He wasn't even thought of at that, at that time, as they'd say. But uh, I just thought he handled himself, the, the introductions, the running the service. Yeah. I just thought he handled himself like a professional. And I don't, that's not the right word. Like a seasoned preacher, yeah. pastor. And uh, so I was very proud of him. They've had a good time. And they'll be, their flight is not leaving until in the morning, so they got, a, they got another day. I, I was talking to him on the phone this morning. And I talked to him about some things, and so he was outside away from everybody else. And he finally said, man, i got to go inside. He said, my hands are freezing off. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I thought, well, I'm out walking, about to break a sweat. So, you know, it was so much different just a few miles in. But yeah, I just thought, I was glad we were able to be a part of that, and our church was able to be a part of that. Amen. And it was great. In fact, the caretaker at the camp told the major last night, so I'm going to send some money back. For the, for the hurricane victims. And uh, so, man, I thought that was, that was nice up there. But anyhow, we thank God for that. I want to read you something this morning. I'm taking a little bit of time, but I want to read you something this morning because I think sometimes we forget what people are going through. Ernie and Tiffany, good to see you. I saw, I saw you slip in there, buddy. I thought maybe you are already gone back to West Virginia on me. But uh, good to see you back. And Miss Tiffany, so good to have you back again. You know, a lot of people have come once, but... Man, hardly nobody come back twice. <laughs> you listening to me, Richard? <laughs> so anyhow, this is, I want to read a little bit of this because it's just blessed my heart. Uh, this is from Pastor Jeremy over on Sanibel Island. And he titled his little message this morning, Tired Christians. He says, is it, and I want you to think about this. Is it just me or has anyone else hit the wall? I think I've entered a new hurricane phase. Phase one was shock, days one through four. Phase two was an emotional breakdown. For me, day five. Mm. Phase three, energetically attacking the problems, day 16 through 17. Phase four today, day 18, exhaustion. 18 days, no breaks, inadequate sleep, it eventually catches up with you. Is there such a thing as an adrenaline hangover? If so, I may have one. The initial rush wears off, and the scale and scope of rebuilding settles in. The sprint of survival gives way to the marathon of rebuilding. A long, hilly road stretches before us, filled with insurance battles, financial gaps, cleanup, remediation, remodeling, contractors, supply chain delays, and long commutes, commutes in slow traffic as Fort Myers and the islands clog with residents, workers, and volunteers. And that's all for just rebuilding our personal lives. We haven't even factored in the work of restoring our church. The world has already begun to move on from Ian, but our work has barely started. At some point, we will each ask ourselves, can I run this long race or should I cash out and call it quits here? Crisis like this brings us to the limits of our natural capacities. Whether we're strong or weak, clever or simple, stoic or anxious, we all eventually have a limit to what we can endure. And then he went on to talk about Isaiah where he said, you know, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Man, my heart goes out. My heart goes out to those folks. And thank you for all that have given, that are giving. And, you know, uh, we're still taking up money. We got, we, we're getting a, a pretty good crew. I talked to Steve and Kerry uh, on, at, on the New Smyrna on the East Coast side that lost all their stuff and told them we would be helping them. And, 
and want to be a blessing to them. And, and man, they were so encouraging to me, and they didn't want anything. I said, well, we're going to do something to help you. And, uh, you know, so we're going to do what we can, and, and we're, going to help, we're going to help this church right here. That's what we're going to do with some of that money, too. We're going to help these folks right here. And we're just going to try and be a blessing. That's what we're going to try and be the church. Amen. And uh, that when people are in need, we're supposed to step up and step out and do that. But uh, as I was talking with Stephen Carey and got to pray with them, I said, what can, what can I give you? What can I get you? And they said, man, your preaching and your prayers are more than anything we could ever want. And, uh, but, man, I, I love those folks, and, and I love these folks that, 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 that are, are struggling. And, again, I don't think, again, we, most of us have moved on. It's just an afterthought or very little thought. And these folks are still just, they're just, they're still just beginning the battle. So can we still pray for them and encourage them and lift them up? So let's do that this morning. All right, I just wanted to say that and read that to you. Uh, Brother Bill, come and let's get opened up and we'll get ready to have church this morning. To the American flag, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To the Christian flag, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. <clears throat> to our Bible, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and I will hide his word in my heart that I might not sin against God. Well, let's praise the Lord this morning we're here. And the good reason, the good reason to praise him. We're going to sing the Glory Land Ways. So let's all sing this song together. Great, great song of faith. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way, telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clearer far. I'm in the glory land way. Notice we have one speaker missing up here. Uh, Major didn't take it with him up up north, but uh, we had to get a speaker. We blew out last week. I guess uh, I don't know. I guess I guess what happened was that uh, Robbie sang too loud, <laughs> broke the speaker. So we we took it to get it fixed, but it'll be back this week. But uh, and I, and don't make me have to get up here and hang myself off those strings up there. But what a great song. And, the bio, and it says in the second uh, stanzas of this song, list to the call, the gospel call today. Well, that's the great need. Amen. Let's sing that verse right there. List to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wonders come home, oh, hasten to obey. And get in the glory land way. Onward I go, onward I go, rejoicing in His love. I'm in the glory that way. Soon I shall see Him, shall see Him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory that way. Oh, praise God! I'm in the glory that way. I'm in. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land. Yes, I'm in the... Oh, praise the Lord. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. 
Turn around and just wave and say hello to those around you this morning. God bless you for being here. We're going to invite our kids to come up for our Pastor Mike's time with our FBC kids. All right, come on up here, youngins. We're slow moving this morning, man. Slow moving this morning. All right, all right. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thought maybe I stunk this morning. Everybody, they, they moved all back away from me. Did I stink? No. No. Well, good morning. Yeah, I feel like I'm back in school. Walking into the classroom, say good morning. Go. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, hope I don't have to take that to the bank and get much money on it. Good to see everybody out this morning. Does anybody remember what we talked about last Sunday? We talked about a great big thing. We're talking about the attributes of God. Jimmy, were you here last Sunday? Yeah. What did we talk about? You would remember. We're talking about the self-sufficiency of God. Today I want to throw another thing on you that describes the character of God. God is self-existent. Say that with me. self Existent. Self existent. Are you self existent? Is there anybody you know that's self existent? You are? Huh? God is. God is the only person that is self existent. That means He needs no one, He needs nothing, He doesn't have to have anything to exist. Now I'm going to say this to you. And this, this can blow your mind, but I want you to try to grab it. Maybe as a child you can grab it. God has always been, and He will always be. And He doesn't need, remember when Moses told him, said, you know, who am I going to say to Pharaoh, who sent me? And God said, tell him that the I am, that I am has sent you, and that means the self-existent one. So when you think about God, God is bigger than anything you can imagine. You need somebody. People say, I don't need anybody. You need somebody to exist. We all, every one of these people needs somebody to exist. Only God is self-existent. Amen? Say it with me one more time. Self-existent. God is Self-existent. Good. Good job, guys. Have a great day. We love you. Song of faith we're going to sing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. While wow, this is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Do you, do you agree with that? be able to praise him in the morning and the night anytime every day all day long let's sing blessed assurance jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation purchase of god born of his spirit washed in his blood this is my story this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above.
perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. if we uh, sing that chorus one last time and I'm going to direct it just a little different so just follow me but uh, you know we just can't praise God enough I think for his goodness to us and boy I've really appreciated the podcast over the past 70 plus days about God uh, you know who he is and we've learned so much more about uh, the deep things I think of God through his uh through his abilities and through who he is. And uh, I just thank God for that. Every time we read the Bible, y'all learn a little more about who God is. And we're going to sing this, and th- I hope this is your story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day Brooks, appreciate that, man. Miss Ruth, God bless you. We're going to get ready to go to prayer this morning, and before we do, we've got a birthday today. I see somebody looking in the air back there. It must be someone in the building, and it's Miss Glenna Rooks. So, Miss Glenna, happy birthday to you. 29 years old today, right? And holding. So God bless you. We appreciate Miss Glenna, and I tell you what, I, I fell in love with Miss Glenna, and we worked together at Everglades, and boy, I tell you what, what a, what a fine Christian lady, and we used to sing together over there, and uh, Miss Glenna can sing, and I, of course, I was the guy who would probably instigate it, but uh, we can't sing here what we sang there, can we? But uh, we had a good time, and I appreciate Miss Glenna. What a blessing she's been to us and to our church, so happy birthday, Miss Glenna. And then yesterday was KK's birthday. They celebrated in West Virginia on her ninth birthday. They got her a little birthday cake there to to camp, and I appreciate that. But, uh, man, what a a day that was. Ladies' lunch is planned for November the 1st from 1 to November 1st at 12 here at the church. So put that down. That's a Tuesday. The ladies are having a luncheon on November the 1st at 12 o'clock here at the church. Let's continue to pray for the hurricane victims. I said this morning, it touches my heart, man. It goes out to me, these, these people, and I thank God that people are wanting to donate. People are giving, and people are sending in money, and we will be doing what we can for them. Continue to pray for Ukraine. Man, I just, I just, I just think, you know, I just told the guys back in the back, we were talking back there, God can, you know, God's doing things in Ukraine. He can do the same thing here in America. We just have to have the faith to believe it. And, uh, you know, when you got bombs dropping on your head, it's, it's, I guess it's easier to have faith in God. Amen? Why is it that when things are going good, we have faith in self? But when things go bad, you realize that self wasn't a very good person to have faith in. Amen? So uh, let's pray for the people of Ukraine. Uh, Nina has got a, had a whole thing of things that she wants us to pray about. And they're praying for a pastor and a preacher there at the, their Inspiration Center. I thought, man, oh man, do I want to go there? But uh, I don't think I'm the guy for that. But pray for them. Pray for Pastor Randy Skeen, still in uh, intensive care in the hospital, waiting to transfer him out to the university hospital. Pray for him and his family. Pray for Pastor Donnie. We met with Donnie uh, Tuesday. Was it Tuesday morning when the elders met? By the way, Ernie, you remember Donnie? Back, you, you went to school with Dave, didn't you? David? You know Donnie? 
Donnie said to tell you, give you his best. But uh, we, were, we just met with Donnie online on the, on the big screen, and he was sharing with us about the Ukraine experience. And by the way, our church picked up to support them as a missionary for $100 a month for the Ukraine work over there, and I thank you for that. And uh, so keep that in mind. But Donnie, we'd been praying for Donnie for months that had had cancer and had been dealing with that, and then they, they thought they had knocked that cancer out and uh, had gotten rid of it. He had to go back to the doctor right before he went to the Ukraine, and when he got back from the Ukraine, he said he had a message to call his doctor. And he said, I called, and the surgeon answered the phone and said, uh, he talked to me like he was my friend. Anyhow, Donnie's going to have surgery on the 25th of October. There's a spot in there that they're not, he said, it was up to me. He said, I wouldn't do anything about it. He, man, he's got the best attitude in the world. But his sister's a doctor. He's got two daughters. I believe both of them are doctors or something way up in the medical field. And he said, man, they're, they are pushing me to get this taken care of. And, and he said, I just want God to get the glory out of it. And these guys saw his spirit and attitude on the big screen when we were meeting with him on Tuesday morning. But I told him, I said, I need you. You're like a mentor, a, a, a blessing to me. And, and so many people are counting on him. But he shared with his church on Wednesday, and then he called me on Thursday. But keep Pastor Donnie in your prayers as he goes through surgery on the 25th. My buddy, Pastor Jerry Bloxton, from up in the Inverness area, is in West Virginia today, starting a revival up there. They'll be starting a revival up there. Pray for Pastor Jerry and, and that church, and uh, they'll experience revival up there. I prayed with him this morning and told him, I said, one of my prayers was at least when he left that they know that a preacher had been in their midst and uh, that's a rarity today, amen? And then continue to pray for the major and his family as they travel home tomorrow. Anita Figueroa has been in the hospital. She's one of our online members out in Oklahoma. And pray for Miss Anita today. Donna Tackett uh, needs prayers, and she's not been doing well, but I think she's been back in the hospital. Then Robbie Evans. Everybody know who's Robbie? You know who Robbie Evans is. He's our, he's our decal man that got ran off all of her stickers, her 3D Army uh, uh, decals and, and such a such a blessing to our church, our ministry, our work. And uh, he, uh, you know, he's got a paving company. You know what a paving company is, right? Uh, road paving. And he was running a roller th this week, and the road gave way and flipped him. And uh, he's uh, he's he's blessed. He come out with a broken collarbone, I think something in there stoved up. But man, that could have, he said, I rode it as far as I could. And he said, on about the last flip, he said, I thought, it's time to get off. And he said, when it stopped, I was about six or seven feet from it. So, uh, but God blessed him. And of course, I, you know, preached that sermon to his church years ago, nothing just happens. And, you know, he said, nothing just happens. And uh, man, he's rejoicing and praising God that uh, everything is going well with him. But pray that he have a good recovery. I'd, I wish he was here with us, don't you? Amen. So we're going to get ready to pray this morning. Brother Bill, would you come up and open us in prayer this morning? May God bless you, brother. Let us pray. Father God, we do thank you and praise you that we're able to come out and worship you this morning. The freedom that we have in our country, we pray for those that don't have that freedom might be worshiping this morning, hiding in someone's home. We pray you bless those services. Press each service around the world, Father, as the Lord Jesus Christ is proclaimed, souls be saved and lives be changed. Bless our time here today. Bless Pastor. He brings your word. May you anoint him from on high to preach with boldness and truth. Bless each one that's here today. We receive something that will help us in our walk with you. And we pray for those that were just mentioned that have a physical need in our prayer list, Father. There's so many people, and you know who they are. God, we just pray that you administer each one as it be for your will and that we would uh, just continue to trust you for our outcome on all that we have. Be with those that are suffering from the hurricane. Bless them. It's going to be a long time until they rebuild. Help them get through this time, Father, as only you can. Again, bless our service. May all that we do and say here today, may it be honor and glorify you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I have a friend over in Alabama, and um, we've been knowing each other since we were in elementary school, and she called me, and she told me that she had lost her mother, and so um, at 98 years old, 
And so she asked me to sing this song for her. So I'm going to sing it this morning. It's one of my regular songs, but this is for Brenda. When I see the sunrise in the morning, when I feel the wind blow across my face, Miss Jean, I love that. Well, I'm going to do something that's probably going to get me in trouble, but I'm going to do it anyhow because I fed, led, felt led to do it. Pastor Brooks, come up. Brother Bill, come up. Brother Clarence, come up for just a minute. I want to pray. Ernie, would you come up here? I want to pray for his brother this morning, Kim, who is a classmate of mine. And these guys, we go back 40, 50 years. And I know that Ernie's heart is heavy. And, uh, man, I, what a blessing you've been to me. I want you to know that. And to meet Miss Tiffany, what a blessing. But I, can we pray with you this morning for Kim yes. as he's battling this cancer? And it's severe. It's not, we're not talking about something simple, is it? It's severe. And he's leaving tomorrow. His dad's celebrating his 90th birthday, so he's going back to be with him. His mom and dad are both alive, been good Christians for, my goodness, years and years and years and years and years. But... I just felt led to pray for Kim this morning. So let's put our hands right here, guys, and join up and pray. And dear God, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we're so glad that we serve a God that's still on the throne. And Lord, I just felt led this morning to have Ernie come up and 
to pray with him for Kim today. And Lord, I know his heart's heavy. And Lord, Kim is putting his faith in you. And Lord, that no matter what happens, he's going to trust you. But Lord, we ask you to be merciful to him today. Yes. Lord, if it be your will, that you would just spare him and touch him and heal him and help him. Yes. And God, give him the strength that he needs today. Lord, him and his wife, his family. Lord, I pray that you'll just strengthen Ernie today, Lord, and help him as he's already lost a brother. And Lord, I, I pray, God, that you'll just comfort him and help Amen. him today. Lord, that he'll be strong for his mom and dad and bless them. And Lord, it, it's, 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 it's devastating when cancer and sickness comes in. Yes. And Lord, I pray that you keep your hand up on them today and, and bless their whole family. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I appreciate that. Thank you. Love you, buddy. Love you. Now, I hope you won't stay away after me doing that. But I, I, just, I just felt led to pray for Kim this morning. And, man, again, it's just a, a taunt of... I was talking to somebody today, just a mere mention of the word, the cancer, that C word is enough to, to shake you plumb down into your bin. Amen. We got your Bible this morning, open up to Luke chapter 21, verse number 25. Here's the title of my sermon. Sometimes you get a pretty good title. I got a pretty good, I feel like I got a good title this morning. Now the only bad thing about having a good title is it doesn't make for a good sermon. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, in fact, when I go home on Sunday and on Monday, I hardly ever think that I've ever preached a good sermon. And I preached a bunch of them in 40-some years, but I, did, I hardly ever think any of them are any good. Are they truthful? Yes. Are they good? Probably not. But I do have a title this morning I thought was appropriate for this time. And my title this morning is, Don't Let Disasters destroy you. Don't let disasters destroy you. Let me say it one more time. Don't let disasters destroy you. I can tell you in my years in the ministry, I've seen disasters destroy a lot of people. They get shipwrecked, they give up on God, they throw the towel in, and, and they just abandon the Lord. And I want to say to you, the only man, the only hope you've got Amen. is the Lord Jesus Christ. If things go good, if things go bad, if things continue the same, the best hope you have, the only hope you have Amen. is to stay with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter number 21, I want to begin reading verse number 25. Jesus said, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts filling them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. You know, I'm just thinking, how many people got in that bad rainstorm Friday night? I mean, man, we had a, we had a, we had a gully washer, a toad strangler. And uh, I don't know, did you get up on your end, Miss Jean? Huh? Some people, Pastor Brooks says, some people got hell. I don't know if we got hell or not. I didn't see any hell, but I tell you what, we sure got a lot of wind and rain. Amen. Miss Vivian was just in here a minute ago. I think they got some damage where they live. They got some damage to their place in that storm. But I looked up the definition of disaster to see what the dictionary would say. What's a definition of disaster? And it said a sudden event such as an accident or a natural catastrophe that causes great damage or loss of life. Wow. Causes great damage or loss of life. And I, I you know, again, you can tell my heart's soft and tender with the, the Hurricane Ian and all the victims that he has left behind and still fresh in our minds. The war in Ukraine. As, as I listen and... and 
And, you know, I just continue to hear Pastor Donnie and, and Nina and those people talk about what God is doing over there, that they're experiencing revival in the midst of a war. And churches are being raised up in the midst of a war. And people are open and hungry and receptive to the Word of God. And they're having church every day. Which would be enough to cause some people to go home and not come back to church in America. It's sad, isn't it? Then we got to talk of nuclear war. And our president talks about Armageddon. He talks about, I don't know if he knows what he's talking about. It doesn't sound like it. Armageddon's on the other side of the thousand years if you want to put on the correct side of the timeline of biblical history. There's no war that's going to be fought today that's going to be the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon is after the rapture of the church, after, after the seven-year tribulation. And, and then we'll see the battle of Armageddon. That's when you'll see that. And then Jesus will come back and rule and reign for a thousand years on this earth. We're not, ready. We're not facing the battle of Armageddon. Could we face nuclear war? We could. Could Putin let one off? He could. Could the Ukraine let one off and blame Putin? They could. Could North Korea let one go and blame somebody? They could. Could America do that? They could. So we've got all these things that are looming with all these other disasters and these storms and hurricanes and tornadoes and wildfires and everything that's going on. I feel it's important to give you a word of comfort this morning. Don't let disasters destroy you. Remember what I say. Boy, how true this is. Everybody is either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or getting ready to go into a storm. We could change that to disasters. Everybody's either in a disaster, coming out of a disaster, or getting ready to go into one. And you know, I'm going to say this this morning. Nobody wants to be in a storm or face a disaster. As I talked to Pastor Donnie the other night, boy, he just, he just touched my heart, his faith and his trust in the Lord. And, to, and, you know, he just, for the glory of God, whatever it is, I'll suffer with cancer for the glory of God. I said, well, pray that I die with a heart attack or something. I said, I don't want to suffer with that. I don't, want, I don't like pain. I don't like suffering. But you know what? The Bible says that we learn. And God can do a great work and draw us in close to Him in suffering. But I don't like it. I don't know anybody that likes a storm or a disaster, do you? Nobody likes that kind of thing. But however, we can't avoid them in this world. But remember, Jesus is the master of the storm. Amen. Jesus told us in the text that we read this morning that disasters would become more common as we near the end. Amen. And I want to say to you this morning, I don't know what you believe, don't know how you believe, don't really care what you believe right now. Because I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. We are nearing the end of the church age. We're seeing things happen in an accelerated race and pace that we've never seen in the history of the world. We are coming to the close of this church age when Jesus is about ready to step out and come and get to church and take us home before the great tribulation falls. People say, well, I think the church is going to go through tribulation. Well, I don't. And I don't think the Bible teaches that. Now, will you have tribulation? Yes. Will you have trouble? Yes. Will you have storms? Yes. Will you have heartaches? Yes. But don't confuse that with the great tribulation after the rapture of the church. So we shouldn't let disasters destroy us. I thought about this. I thought disasters have the potential to not only destroy us, but here are some other things I jotted down that disasters can do. They can discourage us. As I listened and read this message from the pastor of Sanibel this morning, man, he's discouraged. People that have lost everything, they had all material possessions. It'll discourage you. Disasters can also dishearten us. It can take the heart right out of you. I mean, it's just, it's just like sucking the wind out of you. And you're disheartened. It can disillusion us. Disasters have the, the potential to cause us to be disillusioned and not see things the way we really ought to see them. Disasters can also disarm us. You say, what do you mean by that? I'm going to explain that, what I think it means. 
They can, dis- they can cause you to quit praying, quit reading, quit going to church, quit doing the spiritual disciplines that you know you need to do. You get discouraged, you get disheartened, you get disillusioned, and the next thing you know, the devil says, why even try? And so you push the Bible aside, you push praying aside, you push, push church attendance aside, and the next thing you're in real trouble. Amen. Disasters can also deaden us to the things of God. If we allow them to do so, they can deaden us and cause us to get calloused and, and question God and, 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 and ask God what's going on. Somebody said, do you want to ask God, where were you when in the time of my sickness and my family? And somebody said, the same place he was when his own son was down on the cross. He's still on the throne, amen? God has a plan. Yeah. He's sovereign. Then not only that, I want to say lastly on that, that disasters can defeat us. I, I listened as I read the pastor's message this morning. That many people are going to throw the towel in. Many people are going to say, there's no use to build back. We can't build back. We'll never get back. We can't do it. And I thought about, bless that pastor's heart there in that church. I got to, I got to think that there'll probably be many people that will walk off and leave him when he needs them more than ever. Because they're not up for the battle. They're not up for the challenge. So I pray that if you've experienced a disaster in your life, that you will see Jesus in the disaster. So many people have found Jesus in the disaster, in the storm, in the heartaches of life, in the trouble. Listen, most people, when things are going good, they don't think about Jesus. You got money in the bank, you got a big nice house, you got two or three cars in the driveway, the kids are not sick and everything's going good, the job's okay. Most people don't think about Jesus at that point. But let the storms roll in. Let disasters roll in. And so many people see Jesus in the storm. I pray this morning, my prayer is for you that are here and you that are online that if you've been through a disaster, if you're going through one, and if not, hold on to this sermon, because you soon may be, that you will allow the peace of God to strengthen you and help you today. I want to give you a couple verses. I'm still on introduction, by the way. Colossians 3.15, about the peace of God. Listen to what it says in Colossians 3.15. You should jot these verses down and look at them. It says, and let... The peace of God rule in your hearts. You know there's a key word in that verse. You know what it is? Let. You can fight the peace of God. You can kick against the peace of God. You can let everything steal the peace of God. Paul said let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Isaiah 26, 3. I read this this morning as I I was doing my morning Bible reading. One of the verses, uh, chapters I came across in Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Wow. Then Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Peace is a gift. Of the Lord Jesus, the world doesn't have it. Unsaved people don't have it. They've got a false peace. They've got a temporary peace. They've got a facade out there that they think it's peace. But let the storms come and they'll say, man, I don't have it. But Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled Neither let it be afraid. Wow. Then to cap those verses off, Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. You know these verses. Be careful for nothing. That means be worried about nothing. Boy, isn't that easy? That's easy to say, isn't it? That's easy to say when the sun's shining and there are no storms in our life and we haven't been in a disaster. But Paul said, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus, through Christ Jesus. Jesus said He'd never leave us or forsake us, that He'd go with you all the way. That's a promise. You can take it to the bank. 
Who else is going to make you that promise that they'll go with you all the way? Amen? I mean, all the way to the end of the world. Well, think about that this morning as we get ready to get into our message. And I realize as I, as I copied my message over, it all didn't copy over. So I'm going to have to go back to another option here and get my points. That just got my introduction. Wow. I like what the old song says. You know this song. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Man, listen, unfortunately, we have forgotten that. Unfortunately, we've forgotten that we have a home on the other side. Unfortunately, we begin to think that this world is all there is. And you know what we do? i tell you what we do. I've done it. Have you done it? We begin to pound those tent pegs down deep into this side of life. And then when they get pulled out, we get angry. We should live with heaven in sight. We should live with heaven as a goal, amen? Because I'm going to tell you, the world bases its peace on resources. Well, if I've got this, I've got a good job, I've got money in the bank, I've got this, got that, that, that. Just list all the things that they base their peace on. The Christian bases their peace on a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? Real peace is not found in things, in possessions. It's found in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been reminded of that so many times in my ministry, so many times in life as people have faced death and stared death right in the eye and they've looked at it with the peace of God. I I look at my buddy Donnie Bannister and the faith that he has that no matter what, he's trusting in God. And I've I've heard people say, I'm a winner either way. If I go, where do I stay? You don't lose with Jesus, amen? So I want to say to you, please look for Jesus in the disaster that you face because only Jesus can give you peace in the disaster, amen? And then I want to say to you before I get down to my points and hopefully I get down to them, Jesus is the master of disaster. I like that saying. Jesus is the master of disasters. I thought about he's not moved by them. He's not afraid of them. He doesn't get get up off the throne and walk around and wring his hand and say, my goodness, what are we going to do? He wasn't caught off guard by him. He didn't go, oh my, oops, I didn't know that was going to happen. He's still on the throne despite whatever the disaster is. He's in control of them because he's sovereign. Man, I like that, amen. Sometimes... Sometimes when people don't have Jesus, and sometimes even when they do, you can lay your faith down to have a faith failure. But so many times unsaved people have nothing to base real peace on. When they face a disaster, they give up. Mm -hmm. I've heard, I told you this other day, I've heard that people committed suicide because of Hurricane Ian. Because they've lost everything they had. I read the letter from that pastor today, and I I read a broken-hearted man of God, a pastor that not only looking at his own life, but the life of others and the life of his church. And it's easy for people to just throw the towel in and give up, and people are taking their own lives. And remember the financial crisis back when the stock market crashed back years and years ago. They said people were jumping out of the windows in Chicago because they'd lost all the things that they had. Can I tell you something? If you... I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it. If you lose everything you have in life and still have Jesus, you have enough. You have enough to get you to the other side. Amen? Amen. Wow. You say, well, why do disasters destroy people? I think here's the key thing. One, they don't know Jesus. Or two, they take their eyes off of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to give you some disasters in the Bible and how they responded to them and maybe we can learn something. We're probably, we'll find this all in here. I'm going to have to hit these real fast because I want to try to give them to you. Number one, I want to talk about Adam and Eve. They had a human disaster. You see, man, they had a disaster. They were created by God in the garden. They were living in a perfect place, in a perfect home. They had no sickness. They had no trouble. They had no disease. They had nobody fighting against them. There were no cross words until Satan showed up. And you know what he did? He questioned the Word of God. That's where it all starts. If you're questioning God and the Word, you're in trouble right off the bat. 
And the Satan came to Eve and said, Yea, hath God said? And before it was over, Eve took of that fruit and ate it. And then Adam took it from Eve and he ate it. And because of that, this is where we don't understand, because we're not theologically minded or biblically minded enough to know what the Bible says, that's where everything went wrong. It was a worldwide human disaster because the Bible says in the book of Romans, in, in Romans 5, it talks about, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all, for that all have sinned. Yeah. You and I will die if Jesus doesn't come back for the rapture because of Adam and Eve's sin. My mother, my father, my sister... Many loved ones, many people in churches that I've known have died and left this world because of the original sin of Adam and Eve. It was a worldwide disaster. You say, well, what happened? Well, as always, God shows up. And God came down and said, Adam! 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 Did he say it that many times? I don't know. Where are you? Now, I'm going to stop right there and say, God knew where Adam was. <laughs> it's kind of like when your kids are playing hide and seek and they're hiding under the bed and their legs are sticking out. And you're going, where are you? I can't see you. God knew where Adam was. God wanted Adam to know where he was. And when he looked at them, they come out. They come, can you? They hadn't been ashamed. They had walked with God. They had walked with God in the cool of the day. Yeah, yeah. God came down and walked and talked with them. There was no hard feelings. There was no embarrassment. This time they hid themselves. And God, well, what's happened? You don't think He knew what happened? Sure He did. And Adam said, "Well, the woman that you gave me." It's always the woman's fault. And what, a, what a great thing to be a man. It's such a, it's such a, it's such a man. Boy, I'm glad you got involved, Donald. Good to have you this morning. Isn't that such a man thing, ladies? That woman. Hadn't been for that woman, I'd have been all right. And then God said, what about it? And Eve said, well, what, what, what? It, it, Satan. If it wasn't been for Satan, I'd have been all right. And because of that transaction that came up with Adam and Eve and eating the forbidden fruit, Amen. they plunged the whole world into yeah. sin. Yeah. Amen. They died. Do you remember what God said? God said, Adam, you can eat of any tree of the garden that you want. Eat, of, eat, eat do anything you want. There's one tree. Why is it the one thing we can't have is the one thing we want? Yeah. Yeah. You got all these other things and God said, don't eat of this one because in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. die. And Eve took a bite of that. And Adam took a bite of that. And they died immediately. Now they didn't die physically immediately, but they spiritually died immediately and then they eventually died physically. He said, what did God do? God looked at Adam and Eve, and you, they'd been naked, and they didn't even, didn't even bother them, right? naked as a jaybird running around. No shame, they didn't want anybody to worry about. Just living, think about living like that, man, living in the garden, no clothes, nobody to worry about, not to worry about the neighbors. But all of a sudden, this time, they, they were embarrassed. And they hid themselves, and they covered themselves up with fig leaves. And God said, Ain't going to work. You can't cover your sin up. You know what God did? God said, I'll tell you what I'll do. God found a ram. You know what a ram is? It's a male lamb. And cook, took that lamb, that ram, and it, and it was slain. And God took the skins of that lamb and covered them. You say, what's that mean? That's a picture of Jesus Christ dying 
on the cross of Calvary and shedding his blood that we use all the we use good works, we use church membership, we use baptism, we'd be being good to our neighbor, we don't cuss the government. Some of you do, may not. Be. We don't we don't want to get upset. We've got all these great things, and we're trying to cover ourselves up that will not cover sin. I thought of this statement, I like it. Skins for sins. That's a pretty good deal. And God took that innocent animal and set the standard right there that an innocent person, an innocent, innocent lamb would have to die for the sins of the world. You said, man, how did they respond? God responded. God knew what he was going to do. Amen? That's a pretty good thing. And then the Bible says because of one man's obedience, talking about Jesus coming to die on the cross, that we could all be saved. What a God. Amen? Number two, I got to hurry. I, should, I, I, I got carried away on my Adam and Eve story there. I got, I got wrapped up in the, in the antics of that. But Adam and Eve had a human disaster. I want to talk about Job. Job had a home disaster. Man, I wish I had about three hours to preach. Don't get nervous, I'm not. Job had a home disaster. There was a day when the sons of God were gathered together and Satan come in among them. And God said, where you been, Satan? He said, man, I've just been going up and down the earth looking, looking for somebody, just, 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 you know, just seeking whom I can devour, finding people. And God said, hmm, something. Have you considered my servant Job? He's a perfect man, upright, one that hates evil. He's a, man, he's a good guy. Satan said, we'll see how good he is. And he came down and he attacked Job's home. And Job lost all of his cattle and his oxen. And all of his animals were killed. He had, what did he have? How many children did he have? Ten? Was it ten kids he had? All of his kids were killed. His wife went, I hate to get on the women again. <laughs> wife went crazy. Job was covered with bulls from the top of his head. Sitting, sitting with broken pottery, scraping himself in pain and agony. And here comes Mrs. Job. Let's just appreciate women like this. Where would we be without them? And she looked at Job and she probably, boy, you're a fine looking specimen of somebody. Why don't you just curse God and die? I'd say there have been a lot of people that have been to that point and they've done that. They just gave up. You know what Job said? Job said, woman, you speak like a foolish woman. Because Job had said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes. What else did he say? Somebody, blessed be the name of the Lord. Why it takes somebody right with God to say that? Hey, when you've lost everything and you've, your whole home has been devastated and Job's sitting there scraping himself and he said, God gave. And God, we're talking about the sovereignty of God. Yeah, and God can take. But blessed be the name of God. You say, what did Job do? The Bible said, you know what the Bible said? You said how did Job respond to a home disaster? The Bible says he blessed the Lord. And he did something else. It starts with a W. He worshiped. Now, I can tell you, I haven't had a lot of disasters in my life. I've, I've seen some. And worship is a key ingredient to getting through that. Because the natural man does not want to worship God in a disaster. The natural man wants to blame God and look for all the excuses. When Job blessed God and worshipped Him. He had some friends that came by and just, they weren't any help to him. You say, what happened? Job remained faithful and trusted God. If you read to the end of the story, now Job had his moments. Don't, 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 don't doubt that. Because God had to call him up and talk to him like a man. And he said, Job, you're complaining and making all these accusations. Where were, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I hung the scars, the stars? Where were you when I did this? And, and you know what Job said? What are you going to say when God asks you that? You can, 
The Bible says you can counsel God. Who are you? Who am I that we want to counsel God and tell God, God, you messed up. Really? You big enough and foolish enough that you have at it. It didn't turn out good for Job. But I'll tell you what, the end of the story, because Job remained faithful, God gave him back everything he had, blessed his kids, had more kids, and God just blessed him because he trusted God. You said, what, what am I supposed to be doing in a disaster? Just trust God, bless him, and worship on. Amen. Then, then I want to say number three. I wish I had about three hours to preach on this. Man, oh man. I keep saying that people won't get up and hit the door. Number three, Naaman had a health disaster. You remember her name? Let me read to you in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse number 1. And I'm going to say something I've been wanting to say for years, and I've never had the courage to say it, but I'm going to say it today. In public, I don't think. Well, maybe I have. I don't know. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. That's not the end of the statement. There's a, there's, a, there's a comma there that says, but he was a leper. I want to preach on the biggest but in the Bible. But I think it I would probably sound crude and I'm too dignified to say that. So, But I've always preached that. So I'm going to the biggest but in the Bible. But he was a leper. What good did it do him to be captain of this host of this mighty army? What good was it to be a mighty warrior? What good was it to be a man of valor? What good was it to have this position? Because he had leprosy and there was no cure for leprosy. And it was going to kill him and he was going to die. And all the good things you can say. Let me say to you this morning. You say you can tell me all the things you got going on in your life. I'm going to say, yeah, but you're a sinner. But you're going to die. So here's Naaman. And he doesn't know what to do. And they'd gone, into, they'd gone in and taken this little maid captive out of the land of Israel. Here's a, here's a little young girl. I think about Nina over there in the Ukraine. Here's a little girl who's been carried and torn away from her home. And she's been taken into captivity. And she's down there in Syria with Naaman and, and all of them. And they're going on about Naaman. But he's a leper. But he's, Naaman's got leprosy. Nobody can do anything. And the little girl says, You know there's a prophet over in the land of Israel, he could take care of that. And they said, what? Well, I don't know if they said what, but that's what. What? What's his name? Where, where is he? Oh, he's Elisha. He's a, he, he's a man of God. He'd take care of that problem. You know what Elisha did? They, they, they did? I don't think they wasted any time. They loaded up, got all these gifts, loaded up all the camels, all the caravans, and here they went. Well, I wish I didn't say people were like that today. They are in the Ukraine. That's true. Today you tell an unsaved person that and they go, oh yeah, yeah. And they went over there and they come to Elisha. Elisha was a, not a TV evangelist, by the way. <laughs> he didn't even go out to see him. Nope. <laughs> they come to the door and name him. Can you see him coming to, coming to the pro prophet's house? And all this stuff out there and all these gifts and all these camels and all this, all this caravan. And, and say, hey, there's a guy out here who wants to see you. And Elisha said, tell him to go wash in Jordan seven times. And that guy comes out and said, hey, God said go wash in the Jordan sometimes. Naaman said, what? <laughs> does he know who I am? Look at the feathers in my hat. Look at my cape. Look at my armor. Look at all this stuff. He said, besides that, the river's over there where I came from. These are nasty. The Jordan's a dirty river. Why would I do that? You know what Naaman said? He said, I'm going home. And he turned to leave. By the way, he's going back home a leper. And as he turned to leave, somebody said to him, somebody had enough gumption to say, hey, buddy. Hey, don't you think since we're here, Maybe we ought to listen and, and try. Ain't going to hurt anything. So you got to come down off that pride yeah. and that arrogancy. Amen. 
Can you imagine naming this guy, man, and everybody just probably just, when he come through town, they just probably just ran and scattered out of the way. <laughs> Naaman said, well, you know, by the way, I'm country quoting a lot today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not a new version. I'm just country quoting it. Naaman said, we might as well try it. And he went down and got down into Jordan, and he dipped down in the water and come up, and guess what? Not, not, I'm going to put it like we'd say back in Logan, not nary thing happened. <laughs> Nothing. Zilch. He, looked, he said, what do I look like, boys? What do I look like? I said, you don't look any different to me. How many times did he say do it? He said, do it seven times. He said, oh, man. Do it again. He dipped him again. Come up, so what do I look like? He said, you don't look a bit different to me. I bet by about the fifth or sixth time, I bet Naaman's blood was boiling. Here's a man, a great military man, a great man of valor, this great man of honor. He's down there in the dirty water. Down there just embarrassing himself. He probably, I don't know if he said this on number six, but he said, I'd give up. I ain't going to, I ain't going to, I ain't put myself through this again. I'm finished. And I don't know if that same little guy said, what about doing it one more time? God said seven. You know, it's important to obey what God says, by the way. We always want to shortcut God and change it. And they say, he said, do it seven times, name And he said, well, look at me. Nothing's different. Six times, I'm dirty, I'm stinky. I got this old dirty water on me. Look at me. And they said, do it one more time. Please do it one more time. He come up and said, what do I look like, boys? What do I look like? They said, well, you ain't going to believe it. You ain't going to believe it. Man said his skin had just turned back to just turn back the way it was. And he said, man, can you believe that? You say, what did, how did he respond? By trusting and obeying what God said. We put the human element into it, and we say that it, it, it can't work. It's not that easy. I bet Naaman went back and everybody ran into it, had leprosy. and said, I know how you can get rid of that, buddy. I don't even know if he ever saw Elisha, maybe. I don't know. I'd have to go back and read the story. I wasn't pre- planning on preaching on that part. But, hey, he went away rejoicing, Amen. cleansed, because he obeyed. I've seen a lot of people make this walk down this aisle. In 40-some years, Pastor Brooks, that's hung on to the back of chairs. John, that the Holy Spirit has just worked them over. And people stand and they, they'll cry and they'll sob and they'll hold on because they won't humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. But I've seen enough. I've seen enough that let go. Big D and walk down in here, man, listen. What did you say about that guy the day of the altar? There'd have been another foot away. I'd have just had to dive and get a hold of it. And they come up different. They ain't no different back here. Amen. But once they accept, That's right. it's like the guy came in that night and didn't turn to be a great preacher. Come in, he sat back there and he looked around. I got to finish up, by the way. Come back there and looked around and said, everybody in the church is a hypocrite. There's old so-and-so and there's so-and-so and I remember what he did and she did and I remember this one and I remember that one. He said, they're all hypocrites. <laughs> Nothing but a bunch of hypocrites in this church. Man, God got a hold of him during the altar call. <laughs> God wanted him saved. And he let loose and he walked down to an old-fashioned altar and got down and gave his heart to Jesus. Pastor Brooks, he said, when I got up and I looked at the same bunch of folks out there, he said, I couldn't find a one. It was a hypocrite. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? We're kind of like that guy with Limburger cheese on her lip. Remember that guy fell asleep and somebody put some Limburger cheese on him and <laughs> he said, man, something stinks. And said so he got up and went out on the porch and he said, man, something stinks. Come to find out, somebody said, you got in your mustache. And that's the way sin is. It's not always everybody else that's in trouble. It's us. It's me. I got two or three more points to preach, but I ain't going to preach them today. Make it a series, I guess. I don't know. But my point is this, in case you don't ever hear the rest of it, I want you to know something. Hey, Ernie, I want you to know something, buddy. 
I love you. I love Kim. But I want you to know that God is there in the disaster. Hey, John, what y'all went, let what you went through over there, God's still on the throne. What you went through with your sister and your husband dying in a week's time, God's still on the throne. No matter what you face, no matter what happens, God is God. If you can hold on, and you don't have to hold on to God. That's a misnomer. If, you had, if I had to hold on to God, I'd have lost my grip a long time ago. Kind of like when you're a kid and your daddy grabs you. Come on, boy, you're going with me. You don't have to worry about holding on. I can't hold on, Daddy. You don't have to hold on. Daddy had me. Daddy's hands are a lot bigger than mine and a lot stronger. I serve a God who's bigger and stronger than I am that can hold on to me when I don't have strength to hold on. God can hold on to me. And I want to say to you this morning, I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what your need is. I, you say, you didn't get to my disaster. Give me time I could have probably. Yes. But God is the master of disaster. Yes. Pastor Brooks, let's come. Let's sing. And then I want to say something before we, before we dismiss today. Can I? Yes. Calvary covers it all. You think about that. Worship, Pastor mentioned worship a few moments ago. Worship denotes the worthship of God. So the question for you today is this. Is God worth it to give your life to Him? And we, I found out almost 50 years ago now, by giving my life to Jesus, He is worth it. He absolutely is. Let's sing together. You come today. Give your heart to Jesus. some business that we need to attend to this morning so I'm going to ask you to turn the camera off just in a minute and if you need to leave Richard so good to have you brother I appreciate you being here hope you'll come back and uh, everybody else God bless you have a great day if you want to stay you can but if you don't want to stay understand we just got some church business we need to take care of this morning and then we're going to move on so tell Kathy when you go over there Big D get those kids that we're going to take care of some church business so she'll know what's going on God, thank you for the day. Thank you for the message, Lord. Thank you that we don't have to quit and be defeated, discouraged, and destroyed in disasters. And Lord, I pray that you just help us, Lord, to be what you'd want us to be. And thank you for the day, the service, Lord. I'm feeling pretty good in my soul. And Lord, I thank you for that. And ask that you bless these folks that were here today that gave us their time and those that are online. And Lord, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to give you about a minute or two if you want to leave. You can. And then we're going to start up here just a minute. I've got something I need to tell you. Richard. Thank you, my brother.